Hello, my friends, and welcome to the Robcast. This is episode 192, and it's called A Brief Guide to the Undernet. Now, before we talk about what the Undernet is and why, <laughs> and why I think you need a brief guide to it, a couple things coming up. First, next Largo show is June 4. Largo is a club here in Los Angeles, near where I live. I'll be doing a new show, and I will have some surprise special guests who I think you will fancy. So that is uh, Largo, June 4, and tickets for all uh, Largo shows are at largo-la.com. And then secondly, the Holy Shift Tour rolls on. Um, next up, Seattle and Portland. And then uh, this summer, I will be taking the tour to UK and Ireland. So I'll be doing nine cities, England, Ireland, Scotland, Wales. Um, and by the way, Scottish audiences are absolutely awesome. So all you Scottish friends, who knew? I haven't been back in a while, but I am coming your way. And the tour is being um, organized by the good folks at Greenbelt. All tickets are at greenbelt.org. Dot UK, and uh, they the fine folks at Greenbelt just told me that London has just sold out, and um, the other cities are on their way to that sort of thing. So a couple tickets left in the other cities, and obviously to all my UK and Ireland friends uh, and Europe friends, I'm looking forward to seeing you there in July. Holy shift tour now, my friends. Let us talk about the undernet. I've been working on this episode for a while um, because at first it just made me laugh, but I just kept making notes um, on all of this. And then I ran some of it by some friends this week and they were laughing so hard that I was like, oh, apparently we should do this episode. So um, this is a brief guide to the undernet, and when I talk about the undernet, what I'm talking about is the underbelly of the internet. And uh, I came up with this word and then Googled it right before doing this episode and found out other people have made up this word well. So when in doubt, make it up and then double down on it. But what I mean by the internet, undernet is the underbelly of the internet. And what I mean by that is that any new technology... Essentially what it does is it expands and extends an already present human capacity. So think about a microphone. A microphone takes a voice and then simply expands and extends it. It makes it louder so it can fill greater space so it can go farther. Same thing like with a car. Uh, you and I know how to travel across the face of the planet. We walk, we ride a skateboard, bicycle, horse, <laughs> but then you get a car and you can go farther across the face of the planet in less time. It expend, extends and expands an already present human capacity. There's also a second thing, though, that can happen. If you tune a microphone up too high, if you push the volume knob too much, then you can get feedback, that high-pitched squealing sound, or it can distort, and then... You can't hear the voice. You can hear even less than if the person was just talking with no microphone. Or take a car. You get too many cars on the road, and suddenly you're sitting there in traffic, and you get passed by a guy on the sidewalk who walks by you. So with, and obviously lots of people have written about this in much more informed and articulate ways than I'm talking about here, but at its core... And as you think about this spiritually, whenever you have the explosion of some new technology, it's probably going to be doing something that's both expanding and extending. And at the same time, if you look carefully, it may be feeding back on itself. It may be collapsing in on itself. It may actually at times be doing the opposite and actually taking things in the other direction. So this episode is not about all the good things about the internet. So that's the official disclaimer here on the friend. This episode is not about all of the good things because, so if you find yourself in this episode going, yeah, but I knew, yeah, but you, you're leaving out all the good stuff. Yep, I am. I am. And obviously I'm in favor of this wonderful new thing, the internet, because I'm talking to you 
into a microphone, which will then be released globally as a podcast over the internet. So there is a thousand giant explosive worlds of good that have come from this internet. This episode is not about that. Once again, disclaimer, it's about the undernet. What are the ways in which this new extraordinary phenomenon are shaping us, are forming us spiritually in ways that aren't all good and beneficial and healthy and necessary for our vitality. So what I do is I have uh, like 10 or 11, let's say 11 truths about the internet. <laughs> and it's kind of ridiculous. I'm just gonna say up front and yet, I really enjoyed coming up with these. So what I'm going to do is I'm just going to read you through my list of 11, did I say 11 or 10? Truths about the internet. Okay? You ready? Yeah, because it's, it's about to go down right here. We're about to do this. <laughs> okay, here we go. Truth number one about the internet. There is no correlation whatsoever between number of views and quality of content. <laughs> You're with me, aren't you? Let me repeat truth number one about the internet. There is no correlation whatsoever between number of views and quality of content. If there were, Justin Bieber would be the king of the universe, and he's not. <laughs> you with me on that? It's like, well, yeah, well, I mean, that video clip, I mean, that, that thing on YouTube, it got tons of views. Yeah, it did. It was a man on a snowmobile crashing into a swing set. Yeah, well, that one video, it, it got like 19 million views. Yeah, it, yeah. It was a cat literally chasing its tail and falling into the sink. Well, that thing got like a, I think it got a billion views. Yeah, it was Gangnam Style. I mean, that thing got like, that got like 10 million views in 24 hours. Yeah, it was a clip of an actress walking in to a restaurant. <laughs> yes, it did. It got a lot of views. You're right. But that is a completely different discussion from depth, substance, insight, truth, love, significance, and enduring good. These are two different things. Now, obviously, something spreads. It gains a head of steam. It gets all this momentum. It gets tons of views because it's great, truly great. It's fresh, original, funny, vital, insightful, true, obvious. Yes, of course. That's an obvious and easy observation. But what I'm interested in, what I'm after here, is the much more subtle ways that this metric, for many, has become the dominant metric. This way of measuring and marking one's work and contribution solely in terms of views, followers, fans, hits, and website traffic. What, what, what I'm interested in is us being wide awake to all of the ways that when this number of views metric becomes the dominant metric, all the ways that it then shapes your brain and your heart and your soul in all sorts of destructive ways. And the, the reason why I bring this up is the number of people I've interacted with who there's like a quiet desperation lurking just below the surface of their work. It's like they're trying to do good work in the world, trying to help people, trying to serve, trying to build something meaningful. And they're trying to get noticed by more people. They're trying to expand. They're trying to engage uh, more people. But what they keep doing is comparing themselves to people who have what looks like millions of followers. And so what oftentimes happens is this, this inner monologue creeps in, if only I had that many people who were watching. Uh, and what I've noticed again and again, how it produces within so many people a feeling like they're not doing anything of significance. You know, because so-and-so has so many more people who know about them. But this is a skewed view of reality. There are lots of reasons for this, but maybe what you do isn't for lots of people. Uh, it's for this person. It's for that person. Maybe what you do is less about breadth and more about depth. Uh, or, or for the people that it is for, maybe what you do 
inherently asks for way more commitment of people. You think about like a clip where, oh my word, that clip has 27 million views. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's 17 seconds long. What you do in the world may require of people risk, cost, sacrifice, commitment, discipline, postpone gratification, intention. It may take years of practice, work, dedication. Who knows? You may be doing something totally different. And here's what I mean. What you do, what you are here to give, your Eucharist, body broken, blood poured out, whatever it is that, that is how you contribute, what you do might not reduce well to the limits and parameters of a cell phone screen, right? Have you ever, has anybody ever said to you, dude, check out this clip. It's a guy feeding someone who's hungry. <laughs> yeah, doesn't really happen much. Have you ever had somebody say, look at this, see this right here? See these two people? Check out this clip. It's a woman sitting with another woman. And see the woman on the left? She's lonely. And the woman on the right is sitting with her, so she won't be alone. Check it out. Look at it. Yeah, amazing. How many of you have ever had somebody say, hey, check out, check out this clip. It's somebody visiting somebody in the hospital. Just watch. They're about to give them a hug and tell them that they love them. Oh, man, <laughs> this thing's going to spread like fire. No, no. But then think about that bike video, that prank video, that video, that viral video of that woman laughing in her Chewbacca mask. It's hilarious. Yep, it's funny. It makes the rounds. It's incredible. That guy jumping off the roof of that house on his bike, and we all enjoy it, and we show it to our friends, and 35 million people saw it and laughed. Awesome. 27 million people laughed for 13 seconds. Great. I love it. I passed it around, too. I thought it was amazing, too. But you may be teaching someone to read. That's a very different thing. You may be working with one kid once a week, and the reason why I talk about the inter undernet is all of the ways in which this metric, look how many people watched this clip. Look how many people follow what this person says on Twitter. The ways in which it creeps in and what it sends to people deep in the psyche is the message, I'm just not doing anything of significance because millions of people aren't paying attention. And that is a skewed metric for understanding who you are and what you're here to do. Uh, my beloved friend Josh Radner wrote this great article. It was in American Way magazine, the magazine on an airplane that I saw two weeks ago. And by the way, general rule, when you come across a fantastic article in a magazine, you take it out. You can hear the paper. Here is the article. Um, but Josh has this great line um, about a movie that he made that he, uh, as he said, it didn't light up the box office, and this made me heartsick for a time, he writes about. And then he says this, our metric for success, it seems to me, is off. And then here's how he explains it. There are no reliable statistics for hearts opened or wounds healed. P Dog, how you doing? I'm recording a podcast. I think I'm on I'm on a roll. <laughs> Preston Bell, ladies and gentlemen, has just entered the back house. He's dropping off guitars, pedal boards, amps. Um, I'm gonna keep rolling. Rock and roll, keep going. I think this is good stuff here. <laughs> so uh, what was I saying? Oh yeah, okay. So let me read that again. Josh says, our metric for success, it seems to me, is off. There are no reliable statistics for hearts opened or wounds healed. Come on, raise your glasses. So good. So, viral, yeah, great. It spreads wildfire, 50 million views, a billion views, fine, great. Love it. Totally into it. I'll watch it and laugh and be impressed as well, but... When this hysteria and obsession with views and numbers and followers and fans, when it erodes the confidence of people humbly 
trying to do good work in the world, we have a problem. And so we need to talk about it and we need to examine it and we need to shine light on it. And for every one of you who's doing what you do and you keep looking around on the internet and saying, oh my word, they have more, they have more, they have more, stop and remember that whatever it is, whatever there's more, it also means more headaches, it means more hassles, it means a bunch of other things as well. What you do may be for, it may be about depth. It may be about depth, not breadth. It may be about sacrifice and commitment. It may not be about what will excite us for today. What your work may be about, what will have impact a generation from now. You may simply be playing a completely different game, and we actually need you to play that game. Which leads me to truth number two about the internet. Okay, truth number two. Uh, actually, truth number two has a truth that sort of leads up to the main truth about it. So, first off, the, the, the pre-truth, the opener truth here on truth number two is a social media app is a global broadcast platform. A social media app is a global broadcast platform. Now, think about in previous generations, a global broadcast platform, a radio station, a newspaper, a television channel. These were all broadcast platforms. But think about a newspaper. What came with a newspaper? You had journalists who had gone through extensive training in journalism. You had a whole uh, code of ethics. You often had an ethics committee. You had an editorial board. So every single thing that was ever published went th multiple eyes, read it and examined it. You had fact checking. You had double source, triple sources. You had the validity of those sources. You had copywriters. You had uh, editors. You had people who would revise it. You had first draft, second draft, third draft. You had training, accountability, you had crafting, review, iterations, revisions, you had producers. You uh, think about a television channel, you had countless hours of editing, discussing, revising, running the content by multiple sets of eyes. Uh, generally, especially like you think about publishing or television, you had a in-house legal department making sure that everything was above board before ever got broadcast or published or seen by the public. And now you have this global broadcast platform capacity in a machine that you can carry around in your pocket. What was once the work of hundreds and hundreds of people who spent hours wrestling with, is this true? Is this beneficial? Are we absolutely rock solid in publishing this, releasing this, broadcasting this? You now can do that from a machine in your pocket, and you can do it within seconds if you choose to. So <laughs> here's how I would say truth number two. A social media app is a global broadcast platform, and not everyone is up to the task of managing a global broadcast platform. <laughs> Are you with me on this? So when you say like, oh my word, my neighbor just won't stop on Twitter, or oh my word, that relative of mine on Facebook, they're just obnoxious. Yeah, that is because one of the things that has happened with this extraordinary new technology that has burst into our lives, this phenomenon of the internet, is these people that we are surrounded by and ourselves, we now have this capacity because of a small machine that we can carry in our pocket. So when you find yourself thinking, oh my word, that person, they, I think they might be losing their minds yeah, it's because they don't have an editorial board. <laughs> or that person on Facebook who just keeps forwarding the dumbest articles. You're like, oh, that's right. They don't even know what fact-checking is. Or that person who says those unbelievably mean things. That's right. They don't 
have any oversight by an ethics committee. They're using a global broadcast platform with none of the usual checks, balances, and safeguards that came. Now, this is not like a neo-Luddite sort of, we just need to go back to how it was. I get it. It's We're going forward. So this is not like a, but just to make us highly aware, that's what this is. By the way, side truth, this is truth like 2.5 or 3 or something. I don't know. Um, here's another undernet truth. The internet is the single greatest aggregation of stupidity and ignorance in the history of human civilization. <laughs> oh my word. Think about it. In the history of, of our species, has there any ever been anything that aggregated ignorance, hate, bigotry, misogyny, uh, racism, like lies? Has there ever been anything that put it all in one place and you could just access it that quickly and that easily? So, I say all this to say, when you casually say, you know, I was on Facebook earlier today, think of what you are saying in that moment, because this is new in human history. Our species essentially never wrestled with this. When you say, well, I can know I was on Facebook earlier today, you were on a global broadcast platform in which anybody anywhere can freely broadcast without any uh, impingements or inhibitions. And it's also the single greatest aggregator of stupidity and ignorance ever in the history of human civilization. No wonder sometimes you think you're losing your mind. No wonder sometimes you're like, I just need to turn off the computer for a while. No wonder why we often talk about how there's so much hate. Uh, we have handed ourselves, everyone, we now have these capacities that people simply did not have before. Which leads me to truth number, we'll call it truth number four. <laughs> We're just getting warmed up, by the way. <laughs> okay, truth number four. There is an inverse relationship between how sustainable something is and how sensational it is. So there's you and me. We're doing our work in the world year after year after year. We've like set our path and our intentions and we're gaining wisdom. We're like students. We're learning the subtleties and nuances of whatever it is that we do and, and what it means to be a human being, what it means to, to have a heart, what it means to be growing in courage and compassion. We're, we're learning, growing, expanding. We're figuring out how to forgive people. We're learning how to have boundaries. We're learning when we're off the path or out of the flow and how to return to our true self. We're learning to listen to that which is deepest within us. Uh, there is what it means to wake up in the morning with a sense of responsibility that you've been given this extraordinary gift and now you give your life back as like a, like a living Eucharist, like the body broken and the blood poured out. You, you understand that you're here for something larger than yourself, and so you sort of humbly set about giving back. That is completely different than saying outrageous things on Twitter. That is a completely different thing than shocking people, complete strangers for attention. But we have this new underbelly of the internet where you can gain a voice for provocation, for absurdity, for outrageous claims, and then you can keep that voice by just continually upping the ante. Two words, LeVar Ball. Um, but what this machine does is it's, ne it's, it's, nev it's insatiable. It can't get enough. Uh, and so it just keeps consuming so that we can then consume. Um, yeah, there are over 10,000 videos on YouTube with over a billion views. Um, YouTube alone produces 300 hours of content a minute, and then it's consumed, and then the next minute, and the next minute, and the next minute, another round of content is produced, which leads me to truth number five. Oddly enough, the internet is strangely geared in many ways in favor of the outrageous. And this is what's incredibly important. If you take something like social media platforms, 
Somebody says something outrageous and a number of people are offended, they agree, you have like a little spike of interest. A number of the algorithms then tilt everything in favor of that. An algorithm does not have a heart in which it can discern, is this good? Is this true? Is this noble? Is this dignified? Does this elevate our sense of what it means to be human? Or is this mean, nasty, petty? Does this move the whole thing forward? Or does this help us all take another step backwards? See, the algorithm doesn't make any of those distinctions. It just knows, wow, that thing over there that person did, it attracted a bunch of heat, so let's send more people that direction in case we can get even more heat going because that's where the money is. There's this great line from the rabbis. They talk about how in in Genesis chapter 1, the divine separates light from dark. And then the rest of the scriptures is the divine teaching us humans how to separate and discern light from dark. But we are living in a world where we are surrounded by the internet, and the internet, many of the very mechanisms that cause the internet to continue to thrive do not have any way of separating and discerning light from dark. And so it naturally gears itself toward the outrageous, towards the absurd, sometimes just towards controversy and conflict, because who's beefing with who on Twitter? Oh, that's interesting. Think about this. How's this for a tweet? Imagine if somebody sent this tweet out. A single mother today was able to pay her rent due to the generosity of her friends. (laughs) See what I mean? Yeah, see, no one's retweeting that. It's just not that exciting. And yet for that single mother who was able to pay her rent due to the generosity of her friends, infinitely good. Okay, here's another one. How about this tweet? Check this out. Imagine the heat this tweet would get. Someone today made a little more progress towards paying off her student loans. <laughs> See what I mean? <laughs> and yet if you're that student, oh, it's like a, a load is being lifted from your shoulders. Or how about this one? A young woman today took another step toward forgiving her father. Yeah. Yeah. See, that's that. See, see what algorithm is going to be like, oh man, feature that. Send more people to that one. Or how about this one? Uh, and this one is, and, and there's a very important reason why I'm bringing up this one. Imagine if uh, somebody tweeted, uh, I didn't drink again today, another day clean and sober. And people do, of course, tweet things like that. But that's not going to light up the internet. And yet, I've never been in a room where somebody said that they were celebrating another day clean and sober when the room didn't erupt in cheers and that overwhelming sense of human celebration and solidarity. So what's interesting is what the internet would be like, huh, that's not interesting. We're not gonna make a big deal about that. In flesh and blood, that absolutely comes to life and does something deep in your bones. Okay, truth number six. Are you ready? Here we go. (laughs) Truth number six. At the exact moment when the world is more complicated than ever, we have had an explosion of communication mediums devoted to brevity, superficiality, and 140 characters. So think about in in the world that we are living in, power, race, sexuality, war, violence, drones, economics, globalism. I mean, think about in the moment when an extraordinary number of people are trying to connect and understand and discuss the pressing issues of our days. uh, Many people's sole means of communicating is with our thumbs in 140 character bites without facial expressions, body language, context, time and place, personal connection, 
the space to clarify, contextualize, and explain what we mean. And a lot of these interactions with our thumbs on our phones are anonymous. So at the exact moment when we have more complicated issues of depth and significance all around us, more people than ever are trying to discuss and sound off and connect and understand these issues from a place of anonymity without being able to read facial expressions, body language, context, and know where does this person live? What does this mean where they are? No wonder, no wonder sometimes you have this sense like this isn't helping because actual human figuring it out is situated in a place. It's space and time. It's flesh and blood. You're working it out in real time and you're learning and there are missteps and stumbles and you apologize and you forgive and you do version one, version two, version three. You try it, you tweak it. It's all part of it. You're in the room and you're working it out. That's how you make a new world. You throw all these things against the wall and you see which ones stick and then you try that and then you try it again and then you fall down then you get back up and then you delete that paragraph and then you write a new one. That's how you make a new world. And the people that you're working with, they're in front of you and you have their name and you have maybe some of their history and you have context. And when they say this, you can immediately find out what did you mean by that? Help me understand where you're coming from. An exact moment when we need this understanding more than ever, we've had an explosion of communication mediums which are faceless, placeless, anonymous, and which people type with their thumbs in incredibly short sound bites without any body language, without any facial recognition, just isolated blips, squeaks, and tweets, which leads me to truth number seven. And I really, really like this one. In past generations, your reputation came from your courage, sacrifice, perseverance, compassion, love, deeds, actions. In other words, your reputation came from your participation in the ongoing creation of the world. You had skin in the game. You were down on the floor of the arena, right? You had a little blood on you, a little dust on you because you were in it. So you had heroes. Uh, the hero was somebody who had acted in particular ways, which singled them out. But now what we have is this thing called celebrity. So the hero did things, things that cost them, things that benefited others. They overcame the odds. They went through the dark night of the soul and they kept going. They left the village and journeyed into the woods. The hero, the hero had acted, had helped create a new kind of world. But now you have this thing called the celebrity who's known for being known. And the reason why I would argue this is so spiritually lethal is you have people who freely spout off on the internet about politics, who have never gone down to the town hall and actually gotten involved. So what happens is you can spout off on the internet and then think you've done something. When the people, the, the true heroes, they're the people who actually sit in meetings and they make decisions and they listen to the other sides and they weigh difficult decisions in which whatever decision they make, not everybody is going to be happy. Uh, they understand that in difficult choices, inevitably they will not please everyone. That's how the whole thing actually moves forward. And what happens sometimes is because people are like on a screen, is you're cut off from the depths. You're cut off from presence. It's just disembodied, anonymous words. But the way in which the world is actually healed, it's actually repaired, the way in which you take part in the ongoing creation of the world 
is you're there in flesh and blood and you get knocked down around a bit. And you don't just sit there and spout off, but you understand that all of these ideas have consequences. It's never that easy. By the way, you know this is true when you see somebody who's spouting off as if it's that easy. You know this is somebody who doesn't have skin in the game when they're like, oh, everybody should just do this. Why don't they do that? Here's why they, oftentimes they don't do it, because they're actually in the game. And when you're actually trying to move things forward, you realize it's a lot harder than it looks. It's harder to come up with new and fresh things. It's harder to get along. It's harder to get consensus. It's harder to agree to compromise with other people. It's just harder than it looks. And we have this new world of people who pontificate. They have great theories about why this film is crap and they've never been on a film set. They go on and on and on about how that television show is rubbish and they've never glimpsed what it actually takes to make something new and fresh and vital, which leads me to truth number eight. There is a fine line between anonymity and cowardice. There is a fine line between anonymity and cowardice. To be human is to be known. It's to put yourself out there. There's struggle and risk and heartache, and there's always the chance that you're going to fall flat on your face, <laughs> which I know something about. Uh, and what you have when your life is consumed with a screen is you're cut off from presence and you're disassociated from flesh and blood. And so what can easily happen is that anonymity where you can just go on and on and on on your Twitter account can easily blur into cowardice, which is no one will ever actually track me down and hold me accountable for this. No one will actually ever look me in the eyes and say, wait, your argument is flawed. Do you understand this, this, and this? No one will ever challenge me. And so it can easily become a place. Then this is true from everybody from the friend you went to college with to the president in which you just spout off in the face of actually learning what the issues are and actually engaging in the discussion and actually wrestling with how oftentimes how ambiguous and difficult some of this really is. So there is a fine line between anonymity and cowardice, which leads me to truth number nine because <laughs> we're just getting warmed up. Truth number nine about the undernet. Because it's easy on the internet, isn't it, to make a polished version of yourself? It's easy to Instagram your breakfast. It's easy to show your glamorous life. But what you really desire is for people to see the whole truth about you and still love and accept you exactly as you are. So what the, what the internet often does is we get to present an idealized version of ourselves. We, everything going great, doing great, check out this restaurant, look at these pictures, see these bikini shots, we're crushing it. But that's not actually what you really want. And oftentimes we feel terrible when we see all the amazing lives other people are having. That's not actually what you want. What you want is for somebody to see the truth about you in your life all of its flaws and messiness, all of your bad mood days, uh, all the things you do when you're frustrated. What you want is for somebody to see all that and still love and accept you exactly as you are. Which is why I talk about the internet is the ways in which this buff and shine of the internet can gradually seduce us into this belief that everybody else has it figured out, but we don't. Look at the unbelievably great times everybody else is having, and I'm sitting here taking the dog for a walk, that's the most exciting thing happening this evening. <laughs> yeah, and so one of it is you have to just call it out. No, what you actually want. By the way, somebody should do this. Maybe I should do this. Somebody should do this. Somebody should do their Instagram should try to make the most boring Instagram ever. 
Like somebody should do an Instagram of all of the things in their day and life that are so banal and normal and not glamorous. Now that would be beautiful. If somebody did that, I would follow that person. Okay. Uh, Truth number 10. Uh, Truth number 10 about the internet. Growing up and maturing into greater and greater expansion and enlightenment is about learning to listen to the wisdom that is deepest within you. There is the wisdom around you. There are the elders. There is the tribe. There is all that you study. There is all that you've learned. There are all the wonderful people around you who who serve as like signs and guideposts. But there is also the wisdom that is deepest within you. There is the you that has been telling you who you are the whole time. And growing up and maturing into the person that you are here to be comes from learning to listen to that truth, the Christ wisdom, you listening to you. It's the Christ in you, you in the Christ. It's the deep truth that it sits beneath everything within you that's telling you, turn left here, turn right here. This time just asks you, what are you doing here? And learning to listen to that means learning to shut off other sounds and voices so you can hear it. And you can't hear it if other sounds and voices are cranked up too loud. So part of the path forward into greater joy, into greater truth, into becoming more comfortable in your own skin and and knowing who you are and what you're to do next is learning to unplug. Because if you're constantly being bombarded by the voices of others, uh, the interesting thing about your true self is sometimes it shouts, but most of the time it whispers. Sometimes you get physically sick. Sometimes you have very weird symptoms and it's simply your body's telling you the truth in some way that you might listen because it's been whispering and you haven't been listening to the whisper. But generally it starts with a whisper. And the problem oftentimes is you're just surrounded by people who are shouting. If you find yourself on a regular basis saying to people around you, can you believe what so-and-so is saying on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram? Um, If you are overwhelmed at the moment with what other people are saying, it's probably an indication that you're not listening closely enough to what your own self is telling you. And that's the task. That's the invitation. That's where the joy is. So what happens when people um, are, are inundated all day long with their Wi-Fi connection is it can easily get in the way of you listening to what your true self has been telling you the whole time. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Let's do one more, shall we? Uh, true. Another truth. We'll call this truth, uh, truth 11. Here's truth 11 of the undernet. They won't forget about you. That's very simple. They won't forget about you. If you go off the grid, you'll be fine. You'll be fine. I have seen more people killing themselves to feed the machine. More posts, more availability, more effort to return emails within two minutes. And in some businesses, for different periods within the day or a season, you need to be like right there on it. But I've seen more people killing themselves to feed a machine. I've got to post. I've got to let people know I'm out there. I've got to let people... Sometimes you need to go away. You need to take your time. The internet will be there when you get back. Sometimes there's this fear that sets in. I've seen people who are podcasting who are terrified to take a week off because they're terrified that everybody will stop listening to them. Um, Maybe you need to go away so that your podcasts are better. Um, People will be fine. They'll be there. They'll be there. So you study what other people are doing and then you integrate the best of all of that, but then you go away and you listen for what it is you're here to do. And, and that deeper layer of listening, um, you need to be free from all of the advice and books and people telling you how you're supposed to do it. Yeah. 
So, so perhaps you are always plugged in. Perhaps you get on the plane and you pay extra so you're going to have Wi-Fi on the plane. And maybe that's maybe maybe your work demands that here and there. Fine, whatever. Although I would challenge that. But uh, I've seen so many people who the internet is. I've got to stay on and let people know that I'm still doing my thing. I got to let them know. Um, they won't forget about you. They won't forget about you. Yeah, you can go away. You can catch your breath. You can take a take a load off. Yeah, the internet will be there when you get back. <laughs> oh my word! This is the stra- this, this feels like one of the weirdest episodes I've ever done. A brief guide to the undernet. There you are, my friends. Grace and peace be with you.